Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read Dream Days by Kenneth Graham. So, let's get going. The situation became grim and pallid indeed when I caught the expressions Garden Party and My Mauve Tull, and realised that they both referred to that very afternoon. And every minute as I sat silent and listened, my heart sank lower and lower, descending relentlessly like a clock weight into my boot soles. Throughout my agony I never dreamed of resorting to a direct question, much less a reproach. Even during the period of joyful anticipation, some fear of breaking the spell had kept me from any bold circus talk in the presence of them. But Harold, who was built in quite another way, so soon as he discerned the drift of their conversation and heard the knell of all his hopes, filled the room with wail and clamour of bereavement. The grinning welkin rang with circus circus, shook the window panes. The mocking walls re-echoed circus. Circus he would have, and the whole circus and nothing but the circus. No compromise for him, no evasions, no fallacious unsecured promises to pay. He had drawn his check on the bank of expectation, and it had got to be cashed then and there. Else he would yell, and yell himself into a fit, and come out of it and yell again. Yelling should be his profession, his art, his mission, his career. He was qualified, he was resolute, and he was in no hurry to retire from the business. The noisy ones of the world, if they do not always shout themselves into the imperial purple, are sure at least of receiving attention. If they cannot sell everything at their own price, one thing, silence, must, at any cost, be purchased of them. Harold, accordingly, had to be consoled by the employment of every, uh, of every spe spe spacious, specious fallacy and baseborn trick known to those whose doom it is to handle children. For me their hollow cajolery had no interest. I could pluck no consolation out of their bankrupt thought, though prodigal pledges I only waited till that hateful well-known some other time dear told me that hope was finally dead. Then I left the room without any remark. It made it worse if anything could to hear that stale, worn-out old phrase, still supposed by the dullards to have some efficacy. <clears throat> to nature, as usual, I drifted by instinct, and there, out of the track of humanity, under the friendly hedgerow, had my black hour unseen. The world was a globe no longer, space was no more filled with whirling circuses of spheres. <clears throat> that day the old beliefs rose up and asserted themselves and the earth was flat again, ditch-riddled, stagnant and deadly flat. The undeviating roads crawled straight and white. <clears throat> Elms dressed themselves stiffly along inflexible hedges. All nature, centrifugal no longer, sprawled flatly in lines out to its farthest edge, and I felt just like walking out to that terminus and dropping quietly off. Then, as I sat there, morosely chewing bits of, so of stick, the recollection came back to me of certain fascinating advertisements I had spelled out in the papers. Advert adver ugh. Advertisements of great and happy men, owning big ships of tonnage running into four figures, who yet craved to the extent of public supplication for the sympathetic cooperation of youths as apprentices. I did not rightly know what apprentices might be, nor whether I was yet big enough to be styled a youth, but one thing seemed clear, that by some such means as this, whatever the intervening hardships, I could eventually visit all the circuses of the world, the circuses of merry France and gaudy Spain, of Holland and Bohemia, of China and Peru. Here was a plan worth thinking out in all its bearings, for something had presently to be done to end this intolerable state of things. Midday and even feeding time passed by gloomily enough, till a small disturbance occurred which had the effect of releasing some of the electricity with which the air was charged. Harold, it should be explained, 
was of a very different mental mould, and never brooded, moped, nor ate his heart out over any disappointment. One wild outburst, one dissolution of a minute into his original elements of air and water, of tears and outcry, so much insulted nature claimed. Then he would pull himself together, iron out his countenance with a smile, and adjust himself to the new condition of things. If the gods are ever grateful to man for anything, it is when he is so good as to display a short memory. The Olympians were never slow to recognise this quality of Harold's, in which, indeed, their salvation lay, and on this occasion their gratitude had taken the practical form of a fine fat orange, tough, tough-rinded as oranges of those days were wont to be. This he had eviscerated in the good old-fashioned manner, by biting out a hole, hole in the shoulder, inserting a lump of sugar therein, and then working it cannily to the whole soul and body of the orange passed glorified through the sugar into his being. Thereupon, filled full of orange, orange juice and iniquity, he conceived a deadly snare. Having deftly patted and squeezed the orange skin till it resumed its original shape, he filled it up with water, inserted a fresh lump of sugar in the orifice, and, issuing forth, blandly proffered it to me as I sat moodily in the doorway, dreaming of strange wild circuses under tropic skies. Such a stale old dodge as this would, have, would hardly have taken me in at ordinary moments. But Harold had reckoned rightly upon the disturbing effect of ill humour, and had guessed, perhaps, that I thirsted for comfort and consolation, and would not criticise too closely the source from which they came. Unthinkingly I grasped the golden fraud, which collapsed at my touch, and squirted its contents into my eyes and over my collar, till the nethermost parts of me were damp with the water that had run down my back. In an instant I had Harold down, and, with all the energy of which I was capable, devoted myself to grinding his head into the gravel, while he, realising that the closure was applied, and that the time for discussion or argument was past, sternly concentrated his powers on kicking me in the stomach. Some people can never allow their events to work themselves out quietly. At this juncture, one of them swooped down on the scene, pouring shrill, misplaced abuse on both of us. On me for ill-treating my younger brother, whereas it was distinctly I who was the injured and the deceived. On him for the high offence of assault and battery on a clean collar, a collar which I had myself deflowered and defaced shortly before, in sheer desperate ill-temper. Disgusted and defiant, we fled in different directions, rejoining each other later in the kitchen garden. And as we strolled along together, our short feud forgotten, Harold observed gloomily, "I should like to be in a cave. I should like to be a caveman, like Uncle George was telling us about, with a flint hatchet and no clothes, and live in a cave and not know anybody." And if anyone came to see us, we didn't like. I joined in, catching on to the points of the idea. We hit him on the head with the hatchet till he dropped down dead. And then said Harold, warming up. We drag him into the cave and skin him. For a space we gloated silently over the fair scene of our, our imaginations had conjured up. It was blood we felt the need of just then. We wanted no luxuries, nothing dear brought, nor far-fetched, just plain blood, and nothing else, and plenty of it. Blood, however, was not to be had. The time was out of joint, and we had been born too late. So we went off to the greenhouse, crawled into the heating arrangement underneath, and played at the dark and dirty, unre unrestricted life of cavemen, till we were heartily sick of it. Then we emerged once more into historic times, and went off to the road to look for something living and sentient to throw stones at. And with that we come to the end of the reading portion it's not quite time to end the episode there's a little bit left for that but we are basically at the end anyway um there's very little left um i think what i will do when i get towards the end of this book is put up another poll for the next book to read so if you want to be involved in that poll do keep an eye out um when we get into around page 170 ish but anyway thank you very much for joining me today 
I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.